If you gave me 10 words to describe Red Dead Redemption 2, most of them would be positive. At its best, this game is immersive, innovative in its own way, and, dare I say it, epic in scope. But if you made me pick just one word, one word to summarise and get across to someone the experience I had with this game, that word would be long. Red Dead 2 is a game that just goes on and on and on, and when you think it's finally over, it hits you with a title card saying epilogue, part one, and just keeps going. Still, despite its absurd length, the game must have been doing something right to keep me on the hook for 80 plus hours, and thankfully I have more than 10 words to try and explain why. While many, if not most, games are designed with some kind of challenge or test for the player in mind, Red Dead 2 makes no attempt whatsoever at challenging you or gating your progress behind difficulty, and in fact will give you the option to skip most gameplay sections after a couple of failures in a row. That's not a criticism, just an observation. There are exactly two things that this game is concerned with providing to the player. The first is an intensely polished and expensively produced story about the last band of outlaws and their futile struggle to outrun the inevitable progress of modernity. In this way, the story makes for an interesting companion to GTA's modern setting, but forget I said that because there's only so many hundred hour games I can play in one year, thank you very much. It's a highly scripted roller coaster ride with tons of flashy set pieces and enough likeable characters to keep you mostly invested to the end. I do think that the game's ridiculous length undermines that story in the second half, and the repetitiveness of the later missions starts to feel like filler the closer you get to the ending, especially after you've already figured out what climax the plot is building towards, but we'll get to all that. The second thing the game wants to provide to the player is a believable representation of the central and southern United States in 1899. This is the game's open world, fully explorable in between the more restrictive story missions, and there's a hell of a lot to do in terms of optional content here, but the thing that will really stand out over a playthrough is the game's obsessive dedication to realistic simulation. What other game lets you walk into a general store and individually pick up every item for sale on the shelves? Clearly a lot of work went into making sure that the game was as immersive as possible, as quickly as possible. As soon as the game launches, Rockstar wants you to forget that you're sitting in a living room holding a controller and believe that you're an outlaw in 1899 America. Just like with the story, getting invested in that simulation is absolutely essential to enjoying the experience, and for the most part the game does a good job of keeping the illusion intact. While this commitment to simulation comes with its fair share of downsides, not least of which is what happens when that believability is broken, it's hard not to respect the attempt made by Rockstar. If you've seen any of my previous videos, then you'll probably know that I'm usually not a big fan of these AAA big budget open world games. I usually complain about them being too big, too long, too empty, and just generally being designed to waste as much of your time as possible. There's no question that Red Dead 2 is guilty of a lot of that, and I'll argue later that it probably could have benefited from having a smaller scope. But to its credit, the game does have an answer to some of these criticisms I've leveled at similar titles. Sometimes their answer is just a vague hand wave in the direction of realism, and particularly by the game's end I think a better justification was needed for why half of your playtime was spent just holding or tapping the A button while travelling between destinations. But at other times the game has some really intriguing solutions to the problem of how to make moving through a massive open world interesting. In particular, the random encounters that can take place while you're riding around add some much needed unpredictability to traversal, and are yet another feature that makes the game's world feel more like a real place. The freedom that you have in NPC interactions like this is easily one of the highlights of the game, and to a certain extent that freedom is present in some story moments as well. Red Dead 2 gives you a way of interacting with people besides shooting them in the face, and while the mechanical depth of the dialogue system remains pretty shallow, just having the option is absolutely huge, and it elevates the game immensely. It's one of the biggest contributors to the game's immersive realism, and I really can't praise it enough. One thing that probably goes without saying is that this game is stunningly beautiful. The environments and settlements are captivating and varied enough that you can quite happily spend hours just wandering around and taking in the sights, at least on your first time through each region. The game is intent on not seeing this beauty go to waste, and frequently revels in its cinematic moments, even giving the player a button they can use to enter cinematic mode at will and take a turn at playing cameraman. 
If nothing else, this gives you something to do while listening to dialogue or travelling, but unfortunately the times when it's practical to do this are few and far between, and the loss of control and clarity you experience while using the cinematic camera make it a feature that you'll only end up using when you have nothing else to do and you suddenly remember it exists. There are a few moments where the game's cinematic pretensions can get in the way and frustrate the player, but for the most part it's an optional feature that's easily ignored and gives those who want to appreciate the graphical details the chance to do so. So, if you still haven't played Red Dead Redemption 2 and now you're thinking that it's worth a try, your last chance to duck out before spoilers is coming up. Ultimately, I'm glad I put in the time to experience it, but that's just the thing. This game demands a lot of time out of you, and not much else. The core gameplay is very simplistic, and there's nothing really to dig into in terms of mechanics. The shooting does have some interesting quirks to it, but it's lacking the kind of depth that would make it engaging for its own sake. Almost invariably, it's the context of the gunfights that makes them exciting, not the actual mechanical act itself, and the later missions have to go to ever more outlandish lengths to keep that context interesting. Don't get me wrong, I enjoyed the novelty of shooting guys while canoeing down a river, but the novelty and presentation is really the only thing it has going for it, especially after dozens of hours already spent getting auto-aim headshots on nameless goons. If you're the kind of person who prefers to play a game for the atmosphere and story, then you'll probably find yourself sinking deep into Red Dead Redemption 2, and you won't come out for a month. But if sitting through one casual shooting gallery after another just to find out how the story ends doesn't appeal to you, then you might still find something to enjoy, but you're not likely to make it to the end. So with that, let's get into it. Spoilers from here. The game opens on Dutch van der Linde and his gang fleeing into the mountains following a disastrous robbery gone wrong. Our protagonist and playable character, Arthur Morgan, is one of Dutch's most trusted confidants, and was raised mostly by him after being rescued from a troubled childhood. The question of whether or not Dutch's relationship with Arthur is exploitative becomes one of the central conflicts of the story as things start to unravel later, but for now the first chapter of the game serves to introduce you to the main characters and the gameplay systems in a contained space. I don't think there would be much point in going through every single character, but suffice to say that they're a diverse bunch of personalities, and most of them are easily distinguishable for one reason or another. What brings them together in their alternative lifestyle is a faith in Dutch's leadership, and each of them contributes what they can to the wealth and well-being of the camp. In terms of gameplay, this first chapter is tied for the most linear section of the game, which makes sense here while everything is still being taught to the player. There's a mission that introduces you to traversal, a mission that introduces you to hunting, a mission that introduces you to gunfights, and a train robbery set piece to tie it all off. Considered purely as a tutorial you have to get through before the game opens up, it looks like an agonizingly slow paced two hours, but when you factor in that there are also characters and relationships that need to be established, it's understandable that it was made this long. It also sets the precedent early on the gameplay is often going to be taking a backseat to story delivery, and this remains true once the first chapter is over and the game begins in earnest. With the mechanics and the main players in the story introduced, the gang retreats back down from the mountains and sets up camp at Horseshoe Outlook, roughly in the centre of the map. This is where the game really opens up, and from this point onwards you're likely to split your attention between progressing the main story and exploring the map for side missions and other adventures. Those two halves of the game are mostly kept separate, so I'll treat them separately here too, and I'll start with the story missions. The gang's camp moves location at the end of each chapter as they're chased across the country by federal agents, but that structure of bouncing between optional activities and story progression holds for most of the game's considerable runtime. I'll give some more detailed thoughts on the actual plot later on, but for now you just need to know that the speed at which the story progresses is in the player's hands, and those story missions are mostly built around either executing or preparing for set pieces like robbing a bank or assaulting a mansion, interspersed with the odd quieter scene to allow the characters a chance to share their perspectives or comment on the gang's plight. Almost every single mission in the game starts with you listening to dialogue on horseback while holding A for a minute or two and you can learn a lot about characters' thoughts on the story by paying attention here. In some missions where I guess the ride to a destination was deemed too long, the game will take away control, switch to letterbox mode and just teleport you there with a short montage, 
While I can appreciate the attempt to remove boring downtime from the game, this solution rubs me the wrong way. If getting from A to B in your game is boring, then you need to make it more engaging. You can't just cut out the journey entirely, that's cheating. This is going to become kind of a running theme in this video, but the open world traversal outside of the story missions actually is more interesting, because when you're outside one of the heavily scripted missions, unpredictable things can happen, and you're free to choose for yourself how to react, rather than being commanded to do whatever the game tells you. I'll come back to that once I'm done talking about the story missions. Since almost every mission devolves into a shootout sooner or later, now seems as good a time as any to get into how gunplay works in this game. As I hinted at in the intro, the context for most story scenes is usually pretty exciting, but the actual substance of what the player is asked to do doesn't vary much from that first shootout back in the tutorial. I mean, I assume that robbing a bank is exciting. This is equally true in your 5th and in your 50th hour with the game. Whatever the elaborate setup is for each heist or confrontation, what it invariably turns into at the end is pressing a button to get into cover, which the game actually does for you half the time, then auto-aiming onto one enemy after another and gunning them down. There is a tiny bit of artistry in aiming up slightly from the lock-on point to go for headshots, but over the course of a playthrough you'll become so adept at this that you can even pull it off on enemies that you can't properly see. Something about that just ain't right. Some firearms like revolvers or repeaters need to have the hammer pulled back or the chamber emptied before you can fire again, which is done by pressing the right trigger a second time after firing, and I really, really like this idea as a way to make you feel closer to the weapons you're using. Unfortunately, this rearming is done for you automatically if you release the left trigger and leave the aiming mode, which of course is the only way to auto-aim onto a new target, so you almost never have to properly engage with the mechanic, and most shooting gameplay consists of an extremely simplistic loop of popping out of cover, getting a headshot, then ducking back down. I'm sure somebody on the design team must have fought for this rearming not to happen automatically when behind cover, but I'm equally sure that a lot of playtesters would have failed to realise that the mechanic existed, and got frustrated when they pulled the trigger to fire a second shot, and it pulled the hammer back instead. I should point out that there's one more mechanic involved in shooting, and that's the Deadeye meter. You can use it to slow time and manually line up shots to be taken in quick succession though it's a limited resource that recharges slowly over time, so it needs to be used sparingly. I didn't find Deadeye especially useful at the beginning of the game, where you have to paint over your targets with the crosshair, but by progressing the story you unlock new Deadeye abilities, and by the end you can use it to see kill zones and manually pinpoint targets with a button press. Still, because the reticule moves so terminally slowly when Deadeye is activated, it mostly only crossed my mind to use it when several enemies were standing close together, which rarely happens in the middle of a shootout, but can sometimes happen in more scripted sequences or when travelling in the open world. I'm compelled to mention that the game's very light RPG mechanics feed into the Deadeye meter too, as its maximum size can be increased by pulling off sick long-range no-scope headshots, but that's yet another thing that I'll have to come back to later, because I'm not done complaining about the shooting just yet. The game's over-reliance on shootouts as the climax to missions really starts to stretch believability over time. I mean, the kill-death ratio of Dutch's gang is absolutely insane. Time after time, these guys can show up and take down a force ten times their size without even a single casualty, and it really makes you wonder why they bother going to such elaborate lengths to plan their crimes in advance. For the sake of variety, of course, the game makes you go to the effort of procuring a boat so that you can approach Angelo Bronte's mansion unseen from the swamp behind it. But almost immediately after getting onto land, you're thrust into a shootout and you just kill everyone in the building from your hiding spot behind a piece of wood. By the end of the story, the game will go to some truly extreme lengths to try and keep its simplistic shooting from getting boring, from taking on a battleship in the Caribbean, yes you heard that right, to shooting gangsters from the basket of a hot air balloon. And again, it goes without saying that this looks and feels pretty cool, but it's only the novelty of the presentation that makes it so. In terms of the actual gameplay, it's identical to what you were doing way back in the tutorial. By the way, no comment is ever made on the fact that Arthur kills hundreds, if not over a thousand, nameless goons, henchmen, lackeys and lawmen over the course of the story. And in a game that presents itself so realistically outside of missions, this can end up being quite jarring and undermining that realism. For a story that's supposed to be about one of the last bands of outlaws in the country, it's odd that their rivals are drawing from a seemingly infinite pool of recruits, and you become not only desensitised to this pointless slaughter, but also learn to expect it any time you're in a scripted mission. 
since I'm already knee-deep in Rockstar fanboy tears, let me just add that the little red X that appears over your crosshair to confirm that you killed someone isn't particularly conducive to a feeling of immersion. How do I know that guy is dead? Well, it's simple, really. I know because the little red X told me. It's yet another factor that contributes to making combat one of the least interesting parts of playing through the story. It feels like the only reason there's so much of it is because they were worried about the average player getting bored if there wasn't a horde of people to slay between every story beat. There are at least a dozen examples I could use to showcase a shootout that probably didn't need to be in the game, but one that really stuck out to me comes close to the end of the story. Dutch, Arthur, and another gang member, Micah, eavesdrop on a meeting between Agent Milton, the lawman who's been chasing them for the entire game, and Leviticus Cornwall, the ruthless industrialist whose businesses the gang always somehow ends up stealing from. Milton leaves and apparently immediately puts his airpods in, because he doesn't hear Dutch killing Cornwall or the massive gunfight that breaks out moments later. This scene is fucking stupid. It adds absolutely nothing to the story, and every single person playing through it knows that it's only here because the game needs some excuse for there to be a big dramatic shootout through this coal refinery, or whatever this building is. You might think that I'm nitpicking here, but if you stop and consider it for a second, you'll see just how fucking absurd this really is. Just to make sure the player isn't getting bored, the plot and the fate of the characters in this story are specifically written around the fact that 30 people need to die in a shootout here. And here, and here, and here, and here, and here. For what? So the player has yet another fucking identical shooting gallery to go through? This is just so crap and I know I can't be alone in thinking that. Alright, that's enough complaining about the shooting. As you can probably tell, my thoughts on its use during the story missions are not particularly positive, but my issue is not that the shooting is lacking in mechanical depth, even though it is, it's that you're forced into shootouts so often they lose all their impact, and the story is constantly bending over backwards to make them happen. To prove this, I can tell you that I actually did enjoy getting into shootouts that were unexpected and unscripted while travelling through the open world outside of missions. I told you that would become a running theme. I'll explain shortly why I found the gameplay so much more engaging while free roaming, but first I just need to finish up my thoughts on the restrictive nature of the game's story missions. There is a wide, wide gulf in difference between the absolute freedom you have in the open world and the absolute lack of freedom you have during missions. Whenever you're engaged in a mission, bringing up the HUD will always tell you what you're supposed to be doing at the bottom of the screen. Whatever it says there, you need to take it as the word of God, because if you don't do what it says immediately, then you'll probably get a game over screen and be sent back to a checkpoint. While this is usually effective at keeping the player on rails, it's hardly subtle, and it can lead to some truly awful immersion-shattering moments when the game doesn't communicate effectively what it wants you to be doing. There are times when this can be shockingly bad. If you dare to move in the wrong direction, or move at the wrong time, or sometimes just for no reason at all, you're slapped with a fish and mailed screen and forced to try again. You bring that bastard back to Tilly so we can all have a nice. For all the fancy modern graphics, motion captured performances, and hundred million dollar marketing campaigns, the gameplay here is like a slightly more elaborate version of Dragon's Lair where going the wrong way gives you an instant game over, but here, you don't even get a nicely animated death cutscene for your trouble. The worst error of miscommunication I came across during my playthrough was during an optional Bounty Hunter side mission. I tracked down my bounty but found him with his wife and son, and he told me he was a changed man. The game has plenty of moments like this where you can choose to spare or kill a rival, or help or hinder a stranger, so I opted to take the bounty at his word and let him go free with his family. At least, that's what I thought I was doing, but when I walked away and let him run off, I got a game over screen. Just as a reminder, this is an optional side mission that has no bearing whatsoever on any other part of the game, and still I was given the ultimate punishment of a game over for going off script. We ain't going till you get this right. Since I clearly had no actual say in the matter, on my next try I hogtied the bounty to take him to the sheriff's office, and it turned out that he was lying about being a changed man so I guess the game had the last laugh there. Sooner or later, you'll realise that thinking for yourself is punished in this game, and you'll develop a habit of bringing up the HUD during missions just to make sure you're following the script sufficiently closely to avoid a game over, which really sucks you out of the experience. While these missions are all still technically interactive, I can't help but feel that they reduce the player's role from a driver of the action to just another puppet in Rockstar's theatre. 
You may still be in control of Arthur, but for all intents and purposes, the story missions make him into just another NPC. This is to say nothing of the times when you literally have control taken away from you, and I don't mean in cutscenes. When arriving at a destination during a mission, the game will often make you dismount your horse without even pressing a button. Arthur just dismounts of his own accord, and the startling loss of control you feel every time this happens never goes away. This must have been done to keep you on rails and stop you from taking your horse into a scene where the script says you should be on foot. But the lack of trust Rockstar shows for its players here really grates on me. Here I want to change topic slightly and mention one of my most hated parts of the game, the mission rating feature. At the end of every story mission you're given a bronze, silver or gold rating depending on how many optional objectives you complete during the mission. Usually stuff like getting a certain number of headshots, a certain accuracy percentage, or completing the mission under a certain time frame. Because you don't know these many objectives beforehand, you're extremely unlikely to get gold on any mission on your first try, so you can select and replay them from the pause menu. If the overwhelming number of missions you spend riding along and listening to people talk got on your nerves the first time through the game, then I really wouldn't recommend replaying them for these medals, because the wasted time starts to grate very quickly. And that's not even what I hate most about these mission ratings. My biggest problem with them is that it's such an artificial and gamey way of rewarding or challenging the player, and it can really rob emotional scenes of the weight they were supposed to have, and can even be downright distasteful. I don't want to drop story spoilers just yet, but suffice to say that late in the game Arthur receives some news that causes a big shift in his outlook. One side mission after this turning point ends with him giving money to the widow and son of a debtor that he drove to death earlier in the story. It's a melancholy scene that shows a real change in Arthur's perspective, but instead of letting you reflect on that as you walk away, the game spits in your face with yet another fucking bronze mission rating. Oh, why don't you try that one again and see if you can get a gold star at Repentance? Do it faster this time, gamer! I truly despise this feature because it punishes the player for investing in the simulation and treating it as real. If you take your time riding and talking to NPCs during missions, you're almost guaranteed to get a bronze rating, as if you're playing the game wrong by taking your time with it and treating the world with respect, rather than as an obstacle course that needs to be beaten as fast as possible. So what's the point of all this? Why restrict the player's freedom to such a drastic extent and force them to follow a narrow set of rules while they're in a story mission? The answer, of course, is to give them a heavily scripted and meticulously directed series of hopefully memorable set pieces to go through. And, I mean, what can I say? The presentation is pretty damn good. This is one department where Rockstar knows what they're doing, and it usually shows. While there are a handful of scenes across the game where the intended impact falls flat, anyone who made it to the end of the story surely had their hearts swell during the horseback charge in the final assault on the oil refinery, and in those high points, it can start to feel like the long drawn out setup really was worth it. Then you get to the bit a few minutes later in the same mission where you have to take out a guy on a mounted gun, and if you try to use your imagination to do this by flanking him, you get a game over. Your mileage will vary on whether you consider the set pieces, the characters and the plot worth enduring the hours upon hours of linear and shallow gameplay sections that the story missions force you to go through as payment. Personally, I'm glad I stuck it out to the end, but I'd be lying if I said there weren't times when my enthusiasm faltered, and there's no doubt in my mind that the story is simply far, far too long. It's probably about time I justify my complaints about the story's length by getting into my thoughts on the actual plot. I usually try to avoid going into excessive detail on the stories of the games I cover, because it normally requires retelling the whole story before being able to comment on it, which is boring so I don't want to subject you to it. Since the story is such an important part of Red Dead 2, I think it deserves a fair amount of attention, but I'll try to keep to the broad strokes and just give specific examples when it feels necessary. As I've said, my main criticism is that it's too damn long. I mean that both in terms of length in hours, which is easily proven by looking at my playtime, but also when it comes to the pacing of that story, which is done poorly enough that it feels even more drawn out. I'm sure that even if a player was deliberately ignoring side content and purely focusing on the story missions, the poor pacing would still have them flagging by the end. Keep that in mind as we go forward and I think you'll see what I mean. <laughs> 
After the gang comes down from the mountains, Dutch keeps them together with the promise that they just need one last big score to make enough money to escape for good and leave their problems behind them forever. He strings the gang along with this hopeless dream for pretty much the game's entire runtime, and it's a huge relief when characters finally start calling out this delusional fantasy for what it is, though not to Dutch's face until very close to the end. It's kind of up in the air whether Dutch is really a man of his word, or whether he's a cold manipulator, and even in the story's final scenes I found his motivations difficult to pin down. It's possible that this is intentional, but even if it is, I don't think it makes for a satisfying plot to have a major character like Dutch so seemingly unsure of himself. Anyway, the scrapes and adventures that the gang gets into for the first half of the game aren't particularly important for the wider plot, and at times can feel like pointless wastes of time. The first time the gang has to flee their camp and set up somewhere else, they move near to the southern town of Rhodes, where a feud between two rival plantation families dominates the politics of the region. One of the first missions you do in this area is delivering love notes back and forth for the young star-crossed lovers hiding their romance from their families. After the dramatic events that force the gang to leave camp and move south, doing this random busy work for a bunch of new characters was a bizarre change of pace, and the first half of the game is definitely best treated as a series of loosely connected vignettes, rather than a focused plot. Around halfway through the story, frustrated by the gang's run of bad luck and the constant pressure of evading the law, Dutch takes out his building resentment on Angelo Bronte, a crime lord in Saint-Denis that tried to get rid of the gang by sending them into a trap. Because Arthur and co are capable of killing hundreds of cops without getting shot once themselves, this trap obviously doesn't work, and Dutch leads an assault on Bronte's mansion in retaliation. What seems to initially be a kidnapping turns into a pointless murder when Dutch loses it and drowns Bronte in the swamp, tossing his body to the alligators. This is clearly a key turning point in the story, where Arthur becomes disillusioned and has to wrestle with the fact that Dutch has no idea what he's doing. Or at least, it should have been a key turning point, because after this scene everything carries on mostly as normal for several more chapters, before the confrontation clearly set in motion here actually comes to fruition. After this point, an entire chapter is spent on a Caribbean island rushing through a side story about the labourers fighting against the island's dictator. Or something like that, I honestly have no fucking idea what happened here or what the point of any of this really was. You know what they say about pride before a fall? That's all you gotta say. The one thing Guama has going for it is this unique standoff that happens near the end, which felt appropriately tense and cinematic, and I was expecting to see it come back later, but it never did. This chapter probably cost $10 million to create, by the way. When you finally return from that whole mess, the gang moves camp one last time, and yet more new characters are introduced to help drag this bloated story over the finish line. After all the story's meandering, it eventually settles on Dutch's exploitation of the Native Americans as the topic of its closing chapter. The problem with this is that it requires the introduction of a bunch of new characters and conflicts right at the last minute. Focusing on the existing characters and the internal conflict within the gang seems like it would have been a better call to me. The game tries to weasel its way out of this by saying, oh no, these aren't new characters. See, they were there for five seconds 30 hours ago. But nobody has fallen for that. You have great powers of observation. I think the game's ambition to say something about the origins of modern America got in the way of the more personal, character-driven story about the gang. It's a shame because both of these stories are worth telling, but here they step on each other's toes, and one feels too rushed while the other feels too long. Either way, Dutch's manipulation of the natives seems to be the final straw for Arthur, who actively goes behind Dutch's back to help the chief and his son. Arthur clearly has a great respect for the chief, and in an unassuming and optional conversation with him on the side of a mountain, opens up about the death of his own son and partner many years earlier. There may have been earlier opportunities to learn about this that I missed, but this was the first I heard of it, and I appreciated the insight into Arthur's character. In an optional series of side missions also from this last chapter, Arthur befriends an old Civil War veteran and hangs out in his cabin, and the screen fades to black when Arthur starts talking about himself, skipping over the conversation. This frustrated me to no end because I really wanted to learn more about his perspective, and I'm not really sure why this was done. It's also in this final chapter that Arthur is diagnosed with tuberculosis, pretty much a death sentence in 1899, and the shock of this causes a rapid change in his outlook. Knowing that the gang's days are numbered, and wanting to accomplish something worthwhile before dying, Arthur makes an attempt at redemption by resolving to help John, Abigail, and their son Jack make it out of the coming confrontation unscathed. 
when the story finally reaches its inevitable conclusion in the face-off between Dutch, Arthur, John and Micah, it's a genuinely tense and dramatic scene where the tension feels well earned after dozens of hours of getting to know these characters. I was in suspense waiting for an explosive release of that tension when the scene was suddenly interrupted by, you guessed it, another horde of nameless enemies for you to pop up and headshot one after the other. This would have been a perfect place for another standoff like the one at the end of Guama, but even at the very end, this game can't help but interrupt itself with another fucking gunfight. Dutch and the others who were pointing guns at us and wanted to kill us only seconds ago are just over there on the right during this, by the way. Eventually, Arthur sacrifices himself to ensure John's escape, which is an ending that won't surprise anybody at this point, but it's a fitting conclusion to Arthur's story and to the game. Or is it? Here's where the epilogue begins and the pace of the game is reset back to zero once again. Eight years later, John and his family try to build an honest life for themselves until an old gang member turned bounty hunter, Sadie, shows up with news of Micah's whereabouts. Oh, uh, you play as John now, by the way. Abigail begs John to drop it and just enjoy their new life together, but he can't let it go and ventures out with Sadie and Charles to take revenge on the man who betrayed them so long ago. Both Sadie and Charles are badly injured in this sequence, and it looks like they're going to pay the ultimate price for refusing to let go of the past. But actually, in the end, it turns out they're both fine. John also doesn't have to pay any kind of price for this revenge, which felt like a bit of a cop-out, especially given Abigail's warning earlier. If you've played the original Red Dead, no, not that one, that one, then you know that John actually ends up paying a very hefty price in the end. But still, it was a bit unsatisfying to see him have his cake and eat it at the end of this game. So that's it for the game's story. In case you don't believe me when I say it's too long, I skipped over about 8 hours worth of stuff from the epilogue because it adds nothing to the overall plot. Hopefully I've justified my complaint about the story's pacing too, as it zigzags from location to location, setting up conflicts, then making you wait dozens of hours before they actually amount to anything. Without a doubt, the chapter set in Guama could have been lost entirely with the game's plot being barely affected, and I'm not really sure what they were going for with it. Because the gang's camp moves around the map throughout the story, at times it does feel a bit like the story was written around the need to use every section of the game's map, and it wouldn't surprise me if the designers often came up with a mission set piece before coming up with a story excuse for it to be there. There's no doubt in my mind that this is the case for the mission I mentioned earlier, where Dutch kills Leviticus Cornwall in Ansberg in broad daylight. Likewise, any player who visited the cemetery in Saint-Denis before the story took them there could obviously tell that a shootout would eventually happen there. When parts of the world look specifically designed as theme parks for the player like this, it feels as though the game's sense of realism has been undermined. But then again, if there had been no mission in the cemetery at all, then I might have called it missed potential. I think part of the issue here is that the cemetery is only directly relevant to the player during that one mission, and can be completely ignored for the 99.9% .9 of the game before and after that. It feels like it was designed and created just for this one set piece. This is a complicated problem and I don't know if there's a simple solution, but giving the player other reasons to visit or pass through might be a start. I thought this was worth mentioning because the emphasis on realism and believability was one of my favourite things about the world of Red Dead 2 and the standard is usually set so high that what would be a minor nitpick in another game becomes a glaring crack in that immersive illusion. The game's commitment to believability is both a blessing and a curse, and I'll return to that thought later when discussing the open world. Before moving on, there are a couple of scenes I want to mention that were a true highlight of the game and story for me. At certain points in the story, when an absent gang member is rescued or reunited with the camp, Everybody celebrates by partying into the night, and these scenes are fully interactable. While the interactions you can have with your fellow outlaws are not much more complex than those you can have with the random NPCs on the road, spending time with them like this, drinking, dancing, listening to music, and singing around the campfire, really makes you feel closer to these characters. Got a hole in the middle and split in two. That's, That's what, what you call ring 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 <laughs> The fact that they'll also interact with each other independently of the player's presence or input really adds to the experience and is yet another immersive touch that I enjoyed a lot. For instance, the fracture between Dutch and Molly is plain to see early on if you're paying attention, but it's never placed front and centre as something the player has to get involved with. If you did notice it, however, you're rewarded later when their relationship actually does become relevant to the plot. The extent of your participation in these campfire scenes is completely up to you as the player which means that even though these nights unfold in a largely scripted way, 
there's still a sense of freedom and investment you feel in taking part that you'll rarely get from one of the actual missions, restrictive and linear as they are. Fortunately, the glimpse of freedom you get in these campfire celebrations is not the only release you get from the story mission's overbearing handholding. Pretty much any time you're roaming the open world between missions, you're similarly liberated and you have a huge amount of choice for what to do and how to react to situations. Let's get into how that open world works, how it immerses you, and how it gives you that freedom. Right off the bat, let me start by saying that traversal, horse riding, shooting and fighting all work exactly the same while exploring the open world as they do during the story missions. And yet despite that, I enjoyed all of those elements so much more when I was experiencing them on my own terms in the open world, when I had the privilege of using all of those tools at my own leisure, as opposed to when the game dictated to me what I had to do. If I got into a fight, it's because I made a choice to do so. If I stopped to help a stranger at the side of the road, it's because I made a choice to do so. Whichever direction I pointed my horse or my gun, it was my own will behind it, not the game designers. This kind of free-form exploration, where you can choose for yourself what you want to engage with and what tools you want to use to solve problems, is so much more immersive and easy to lose yourself in than the overbearingly structured missions. And it's in this more liberating environment that the game's simulation aspects really come out. Yeah, 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 you have more freedom, we get it. But what do you actually do in the open world in between missions? Well, dear viewer, allow me to explain with a couple of anecdotes. Around my third play session with the game, I decided to spend some time revealing the edges of the map, to see what the rest of the world looked like and soak in the atmosphere, and I was not disappointed by what I found. In fact, the few hours I spent just wandering and going wherever piqued my curiosity led to some of the most memorable moments I had with the game. I could honestly fill a few paragraphs recounting the adventures I had, but I'll just give the highlights. There was an old house I stumbled across with two dead bodies and a pile of money on the table. When I went to pick it up, it turned out those bodies weren't dead, and I got into a panicked close quarters struggle with them before looting the house and fleeing the scene. None of this happened in a cutscene, none of it was a shitty QTE, and while it was presumably a scripted moment that the house's inhabitants woke up just as I was reaching for their treasure, my startled response to that was in my hands and my hands alone, and I was free to react however I liked using all the gameplay systems available to me. Later on I happened across another house in the wilderness, and as I passed into the fenced off area at the front, the owner came out waving around a shotgun and demanding that I leave. Obviously I could have effortlessly pulled out a gun and headshotted this guy, but it didn't feel very honourable to just walk onto his property and kill him for no reason, especially after I'd just accidentally done exactly that somewhere else. So I said okay, fair enough, and left him alone. The crucial point here is that I made this choice for myself. Imagine if some instructions had appeared at the bottom of the screen saying either kill the stranger or leave the property, and the intrigue of this scene would have been shattered instantly. Maybe this feels like a rudimentary observation to you. Of course, making choices for yourself is more compelling than being told what to do by the game. And at the end of the day, a choice between killing someone and not killing someone is an admittedly superficial one. But that wasn't the only choice I made here. It was my choice to leave my horse hitched up in the woods nearby. It was my choice which direction to approach the house from. And crucially, it was my choice to even be here in the first place. There was no side quest or question mark on the map that led me here, it was just a sight on my travels that piqued my interest, and sure enough, there was something interesting to see. A quick side note while I'm on the topic of maps, because I want to take a moment to really praise the minimap in Red Dead 2, or more specifically to praise the fact that you have the option of hiding it entirely so that it only shows when you press down on the D-pad. There are actually a few options for the minimap, accessed in normal gameplay by holding that button, which makes it clear that tweaking the minimap is an encouraged part of the game and not some setting hidden in the menu for tryhards. A lot of games with minimaps have this issue that the minimap is so much clearer to read than the actual game's world that you find yourself spending more time looking in the corner of the screen than the actual space created by the level designers. Red Dead 2's solution, where the minimap only appears when deliberately summoned, is such an elegant way around this problem that I can't believe it's not more widespread, and I hope every future open world game takes note. It really allows the player to get more invested and pay more attention to the world, and in general the hood is very minimal, which is clearly an artistic choice made to keep the game as immersive as possible, and a successful one in my opinion. 
I found that I usually summon the map just to check which way to go when I reached a crossroads or junction, or to help me find the source of a noise I heard while riding along. Outside of those cases, I was usually able to follow paths and navigate just fine without it, and I had an immensely better and more immersive experience for it. Back to the topic of NPC interactions, there's another feature at play that I haven't mentioned yet, and it's one that I think really sets Red Dead apart as an innovative experience. That feature is the dialogue system. At almost any time, you can hold the left trigger to lock onto an NPC and either greet or antagonize them, or if they're already being aggressive towards you, then the greet option is replaced with one to attempt to defuse the situation. Here's an example of a time that came in handy and really contributed to my immersion. At the start of my grand adventure around the open world map, I passed by a tree where two members of a rival gang, the O'Driscolls, were standing guard. One of them called out and told me to watch myself past this point because I was entering O'Driscoll country. I didn't see any reason to get into a fight about it, so I pressed the defuse button. Arthur assured them that he wasn't planning to cause any trouble, and I continued on my way just a little bit more wary of drawing attention to myself. That brief, and ultimately inconsequential conversation stayed with me for a long time afterwards, and it's a true testament to the open world's immersive power that I can still remember it well after finishing the game, while so many story missions and scripted dialogue scenes have all blown together into one big shootout in my head. A big reason why gunfights happen less in the open world than in the story missions is because you're actually incentivized not to kill people in the open world, since it can lead to you getting a bounty on your head, whereas in scripted missions you can seemingly kill hundreds of lawmen with impunity. The bounty acts as a penalty for misbehaving, and encourages you to approach the world and its inhabitants more realistically and immersively. Certain NPCs will ask you questions or beg you for help, and the same dialogue control scheme is used to accept or deny their requests. It's hardly fleshed out and is drastically simplified when compared to its equivalent in RPGs like Fallout or Mass Effect, but if anything I think that works strongly in Red Dead's favour. Consider if that scene with the O'Driscolls under the tree had taken place in one of those games. The pace of the gameplay would have instantly slowed to a crawl as the game entered conversation mode and gave me a couple of options to choose from, and there would probably be a binary choice at the end between initiating combat or passing by peacefully, maybe with a speech check that needed passing for good measure. While on the surface it may seem like Red Dead is offering the same binary choice, only a bit more streamlined, I think there's more going on here. The dialogue system may be incredibly simple, but what's innovative about it is that it can be engaged with just using the game's normal controls, without having to enter into a separate, time-wasting, pace-destroying dialogue screen with some boring selector wheel. For this reason, I got into the habit of greeting almost everybody I rode past, because it cost me nothing to do so, and only pulled me further into the game's world. If I had made the choice to fight those O'Driscolls for whatever reason, then I wouldn't have had to wait for the dialogue to finish, or for the game to give me permission, I could have just pulled out my revolver and opened fire using the same controls as always. Now it's worth noting that each of the encounters I've gushed about so far were all unique to the location they happened in. Not every cabin in the game has an old man yelling and waving a shotgun around, obviously. And not every cave is the home of a naked wild man living a feral life among the wolves. But one of them is and if you do stumble into it, then you won't soon forget it. These unique meetings are usually short but memorable, and they make excellent rewards for players that are taking the time to indulge their curiosity and explore everywhere. Rockstar pulled a pretty clever trick with these encounters, because while it feels like they occur naturally as you travel or explore, the fact that the minimap and marker system pushes you to almost always be riding along one of the game's roads means that they can actually be quite meticulously planned out. In fact, the memorable encounter I had with the O'Driscoll boys by that tree happened right next to a crossroad, so I imagine it was probably a confrontation that many players had, just perhaps approached from a different direction. There are plenty of spots where you can be stopped on the road and held up by bandits, and of course they do so in areas where the terrain is the most favourable for it. It's in situations like these where I actually start to enjoy the game's shooting, because if I do open fire, then it was a choice I made for myself. When you're surprised and suddenly have a bunch of guns pointing at you, you have the options of trying to turn tail and run, taking some of your attackers out instantly with Deadeye, or playing along and pretending to surrender, and you can accomplish all of these in real time by using the game's normal control scheme, not by selecting an option from a menu or wheel. Mostly I really enjoyed all of these location-specific events, but the other side of that coin is that while exploring, you'll often come across a location that really looks like it should have something to do there, but it just doesn't. 
and you'll eventually discover, usually many, many hours later, that the spot was reserved for some kind of story or side mission to take place there. It's like the game can't make up its mind on whether or not to reward exploration. Maybe it's asking too much for every single cabin in the woods to have something to see or do, but come on, why are all the lights on if there's not even anybody home? It just doesn't make sense. Before I move on, there's one more kind of location-specific event that I'd like to praise as an immersive inclusion to the game. Sometimes events would happen as I roamed the world that didn't present an obvious way for me to get involved in them. When you're riding through a settlement and hear a stranger yelling about how he's the best duelist in town, it's obvious that talking to him will give you the chance to take him up on his boast. But when you're passing through and there happens to be a hanging taking place, as transpired once when I was on my way out of Valentine, it's less obvious what, if any, responses the player might give to this situation. Because I knew absolutely nothing about the circumstances of this execution, I thought it wasn't my place to get involved, but it stopped me in my tracks nonetheless, and I couldn't help but watch as the hangman read the charges to the meagre crowd, and the newly made widow wept at the tightening of the rope. This is another completely inconsequential scene that stuck with me for a while afterwards, and I think a big part of that is because, far from being a hackneyed moral dilemma for the player to resolve, there was no obvious point of interaction, which created the illusion that it was just part of the game's world and wasn't happening purely for my sake. Even though, you know, it obviously was, it just didn't feel like it. Here's a quick example of the exact opposite happening, just to demonstrate what I mean. Once when I was passing through the timber yard, a tree fell onto a man's leg and one of his colleagues started yelling for people to come and help lift the tree. I ran over, but I was too late to help, so I started to leave, only for the foreman to turn around and look at me, specifically singling me out from all the other people that weren't helping and telling me that I could have made myself a little more useful. As for you, we could have used your help. What the fuck? These other guys are your employees, why not give them a telling off first? What initially seemed like a realistic and emergent event suddenly felt very gamey and artificial. Imagine if the widow of the hanging victim had approached me afterwards and asked me why I didn't do anything, and I think you'll see why I found this so bizarre. Anyway, the location-specific events I've been mostly praising so far are not the only kind of encounter the player can come across when traversing the open world, and my opinion on many of the others is less positive. Random events that aren't location-specific can happen anywhere, or at least there are so many places where they can happen that I didn't catch on to the hotspots, and this eventually leads to an unfortunate problem. If you've played the game for a good length of time yourself, then you probably know what my criticism is going to be. The first time I happened upon a stranger who needed help dealing with a snake bite, my reaction was, oh that's cool, and it was a nice little diversion while I was on my way somewhere. The second time it happened, my reaction was more like, Oh no. That the snake bite from me? Again? <laughs> Every time you see another random encounter repeated, you stop thinking of it as a real event and start thinking of it as content. And every time that happens, another hammer blow is dealt to the feeling of immersion. I saw multiple strangers that had been mauled by wolves where I was too late to help them, and because I saw it multiple times, I'm pretty sure that they're scripted to die no matter what you do or what medicine you give them. I saw multiple guys get kicked in the head by their horse while turning around to ask me for help. I saw multiple escaped convicts who begged me to free them by shooting their chains, and I could go on with other examples. That last one isn't strictly true because the dialogue reveals that it's actually the same guy escaping each time, but I certainly wouldn't have known that if the game hadn't told me. And besides, hanging a lampshade on the problem of repeated content doesn't make it go away. What started as one of my favourite NPC interactions ended up becoming one of my biggest disappointments when I realised it was an event that could happen multiple times. Riding through Valentine on my way to a mission marker, I passed by the gunsmiths, where one of the guys sitting on the porch recognised me as the man who saved him from a snake bite a while ago. He invited me to head into the gunsmiths and buy whatever I liked on his tab, and I took him up on his generous offer and picked up a sniper rifle. I left and thanked the stranger, impressed and delighted that something like this could happen in the game. When the same thing happened again many hours later in a different town, I immediately felt deflated and realised that my earlier experience hadn't been a unique emergent event, but one that was scripted to happen after helping certain strangers on the road. Once I realised this, it also cheapened any future acts of helping strangers, as it gave me an economic incentive to do so, rather than doing it just for the sake of immersion. For all I know, one of them might be the key to getting free stuff later, so I'd better help them all just in case. All of this goes to show that the strength of the game's random encounters is in their novelty, and as soon as you start seeing repetitions of them, the magic is lost. 
If I'd seen a hanging like the one in Valentine several times, I probably wouldn't have had much positive to say about it. Still, the basic idea here of random events that happen as you travel around is a really captivating one, and honestly I would have gladly traded a shorter story or a smaller map for more unique and varied encounters. I'm curious to see whether this is a feature Rockstar includes in their next GTA game, where the grid layout of a modern city might make it harder to predict which streets the player will be travelling down. If they do though, I'm calling it now, there'll be some kind of random encounter with a delivery guy who can't find the house he's supposed to be delivering sushi to. Which reminds me, some of the other major activities you can do in the open world are hunting and fishing. How's that for a segue? Now this is the point in the script where I realised that this video could end up being very, very long if I didn't make an attempt to try and stick to only the more interesting parts of the game. So with that in mind, I'm thinking just a brief 20 minutes on hunting and fishing, sound good? Here's something I really dislike about the hunting in Red Dead 2. In order to track animals, you have to go into this sixth sense mode where you follow stink lines and footprint trails. I'm so sick of seeing this boring, ham-fisted solution in games that ask you to track something, and I wonder if this is something that Rockstar isn't happy with either, because it's one of the more jarring parts of the experience where game logic takes over and tramples on the simulation. Why can't the game just actually teach you how to track footprints and broken twigs and the like? Maybe it's because we're just not there yet in terms of graphical fidelity, in which case I have no choice but to let this go, but I'm still not particularly impressed that Rockstar fell back on the same trick that's been done to death in AAA games for a while now. On the more positive side of hunting, I do like the fact that different sizes of animals require different weapons to dispatch without damaging their hides, and sometimes a bit of preparation and planning is needed to craft the appropriate arrow type, or to study the animal and work out which weapon you'll need. It's another little touch that adds to the simulation aspect of the game, but weirdly it's something that goes right out the window when you're hunting a legendary animal, which can just be domed using whichever gun you have to hand with no regard for their pelt. This means that hunting these legendary creatures is actually sometimes easier than hunting regular animals, so I'm not too sure about this, but the completionist in me still enjoyed finding the unique critters and blowing them to bits. Actually, whenever I discovered a new type of animal, I usually tried to catch and skin at least one perfect specimen to sell later, like I was collecting scalps for Noah's Ark. I usually don't care much for cosmetic items in games, but I have nothing against their inclusion, and the option to turn collected hides into clothing is a nice touch. Except when you accidentally wear one into a cutscene that's supposed to be taken seriously. Why are you dressed so ridiculously, sir? Oh, I haven't spoken about fishing yet. It's a minigame. Another thing worth mentioning about hunting is that skinning animals requires you to sit through the same animation time and time and time again until you start to wonder how much of your life you've spent watching it. Clearly this ludicrous abuse of the player's time is done with the goal of keeping the experience immersive and the simulation intact. Is what I would have said if it wasn't for the fact that when you put an animal on the back of your horse, then ropes will just appear out of nowhere to secure it there. The selective and inconsistent way in which Red Dead 2 upholds its own commitment to realistic simulation can lead to some really aggravating moments, and you can never be quite sure when and if the game is going to break its own rules for the sake of gameplay contrivances. At the end of a big gunfight, you can loot valuables from the bodies of the dead, but this is painstakingly done one at a time with a fairly lengthy animation. Again, this is presumably done in the interests of preserving the player's immersion, except in the case of ammo, which will just magically teleport into your pocket when you walk over somebody's gun. There's a baffling inconsistency in the rules here, which I presume was implemented so that more casual players would always have a healthy supply of ammo without having to go out of their way to watch this animation 300 times. But this is cheating. It's not about being realistic just for the sake of it, it's about being consistent. You can't have it both ways. The half-hearted commitment to simulation means that when the game does force you to sit through long animations repeatedly, it's just a waste of the player's time, and the ones punished most are the ones that are trying to take the game more seriously. When the illusion of realism breaks and the game's artifice is exposed, it can really make you start to question why you spent so much time with it. This is the blessing and curse that I hinted at earlier, because when it works and you buy into it, you can spend hours just enjoying the immersive ambience, but when the surface cracks and you can see the moving parts inside, those hours you spent enjoying it feel retroactively tainted as well. The worst immersion breaker that happened during my playthrough occurred when I tracked down and shot one of the legendary animals, and foolishly did so while it was in a river, which caused it to sink and get stuck where I couldn't reach it. 
I tried to use my lasso to drag it towards me, but of course that didn't work even though it definitely should have. My solution in the end was to save and reload my game multiple times, letting the moose respawn floating in the river so that I could push it a little bit closer towards the shore before it sank out of reach again. I can't think of a more gamey solution to a problem than that, and this left a black mark on my experience that I couldn't help but recall every time I was hunting an animal near water. It's a shame because there are aspects of the simulation that I really enjoyed, like the fact that Arthur's hair and beard grow slowly over time and need a visit to the barber to be kept in check, but maybe this is just more palatable because it needs the player's attention far less frequently than the more egregious examples mentioned earlier. Likewise, having to maintain your weapons and keep them clean with gun oil is a nice touch that doesn't get frustrating because it doesn't need doing frequently. I really like that you can only carry a small number of guns on your person at once, and that they take up actual physical space on Arthur's character model, because it encourages you to plan ahead and think about what you'll need when you dismount from your horse. This is a case where realism can actually provoke some interesting gameplay decisions, rather than just being an excuse to waste the player's time, as it usually is, which is a big thumbs up from me. Unfortunately, weapons also suffer from the same inconsistency and in rules that we've already seen. When an enemy dropped a new revolver that I hadn't seen before, naturally I wanted to pick it up and add it to my arsenal, but because of the weapon limit I had to choose which of my current guns to drop for it. I put some real thought into this choice, reasoning that I'd be leaving one behind for good, only to realise later that it didn't matter and that all of my unlocked guns would be teleported back to my horse anyway. I presume this was done because it's possible to invest a fair amount of money into customising and upgrading guns, and losing one or leaving one behind after all that investment was probably deemed undesirable by the devs, but I'd actually like to argue the opposite. If you knew that your weapons and the time and money you've invested into them could be lost if you mistreat them, I think you'd grow far more attached to them than you do to these infinitely reproducible ones that never disappear and also somehow all fit under the saddle of your horse. The same goes for Arthur's hat. If you get into a fight and it gets knocked off, you can walk over and pick it back up, which is such a nice detail that I love in theory, but again it's undercut by the fact that you can just teleport it back onto your head by selecting it from a wheel when you're back on your horse, meaning that it's not really possible to lose it. Why bother taking the game's simulation seriously if it's just going to give you a shortcut around every potentially bad outcome that could come from it? While I appreciate the attention to detail that makes it possible to pick up every item in a shop to inspect and purchase it, I basically never did it because it's so much faster to just walk up to the counter and browse the catalogue instead. Given the choice, convenience trumps immersion every time, and I have no doubt that if the option existed to press a button to skip the animal skinning animation, most players would have pressed it almost every time. There's definitely a conversation to be had here about how much developers should save players from themselves and stop them from optimising all the fun out of an experience, but in the interest of keeping this video under two hours, I'll leave you to have that out in the comments. I want to give just one more example of realism as a clumsy segue into my next topic. You can loot houses, cabins and camps while exploring the world, which requires you to slowly walk to every cupboard or drawer and hold a button to open them, then hold another button to pick up each item one by one. Packs of cigarettes, strips of salted beef, cans of beans, packs of biscuits, and what feels like dozens of other consumables are all actual modelled objects that take up real space in the game's world, and I'm shocked at the amount of work that must have gone into animating Arthur picking up things at all kinds of elevations and positions. Now that's all well and good, but why are you spending so much time picking up biscuits for god's sake? Well, this is where the light RPG, or I guess you could say light survival aspects of the game come in. In the game's fairly minimal HUD, Arthur has three bars that you need to keep track of and top up every now and then. Health, Stamina, and Deadeye. Each of these bars can be refilled instantly by using somewhat valuable consumables, or left to gradually refill on its own, but the rate of refill is dependent on the core status of the bar. A core in a better condition means the bar refills faster, and since those cores drain slowly over time, you'll be chugging beans and puffing cigs to keep them topped up. If you're thorough about picking things up and looting bodies, you'll probably never be short on snacks to fill up Arthur's rumbling tummy, and there'll almost certainly never be a time where you're actually forced into hunting and cooking meat to keep yourself going. But because cooked meat is the only thing that fills all three bars at once, it's still worth doing occasionally. The size of the bars will be permanently increased over time, as you do stuff like drinking snake oil tonics or sprinting long distances, and this is why I said there's a very light RPG element to the game. I'm extremely grateful to be able to describe them as very light, because honestly I'm kind of sick of RPG mechanics being in every game now, 
If I'd launched the game for the first time and found that Arthur's weapon was called something like Legendary Cattleman Revolver of Plus 3 Luck, I would have turned it off and uninstalled. God of War, I'm looking at you. I think the reason so many open world games are leaning towards this kind of tiresome loot economy is because the devs can't come up with another good way of encouraging you to explore and see all the environments they worked hard on. They force you to do it by demanding that you're constantly looking for resources to keep up with some kind of gear curve. Red Dead 2's refreshing reply to this trend is that the content you experience while exploring is its own intrinsic reward. The money I picked up in that house at the edge of the map was ultimately meaningless to me. What I really got from that encounter was an interesting and memorable experience. For all the issues I have with the game, Red Dead 2 at least recognises this and lets most of its content speak for itself, which is a move I have a lot of respect for. The horse bonding system is another light mechanic that levels up as you play, and I think its inclusion is well justified. Your bond with your horse is increased by treating it well, feeding it, brushing it, and hitching it to posts or trees, rather than just leaving it standing in random spots. I like this last one in particular because it encourages and rewards you for taking the simulation more seriously, and even once I had the max relationship level with a horse and no longer benefited from hitching it properly, I still kept up the habit. Improving your horse bond increases your mount's independent health and stamina bars, and hitting the max level of 4 unlocks horse drifting, which honestly sounds like a joke to me, but whatever. Unlike weapons and hats, horses actually do feel like unique and irreplaceable companions on your journey, because they can die, and when they do, they're gone for good. This really incentivizes you to take care of and respect your horse, since once you've named it and put in the time and effort to form a bond, you really won't want to see all that go to waste. Again, I think the game could have benefited from treating guns the same way, but I won't repeat myself. Because of the care I put into respecting my horses, I only lost one or two over the course of my playthrough. The first time this happened, it was because a rival gang surprised me and opened fire with a stationary machine gun before I could fully process what was going on, and I died trying to race towards the trees for cover. When I respawned and whistled for my horse, I could immediately tell something was wrong. I mean, this clearly wasn't my horse, and I had no idea where it came from. After checking back at camp and in a stable with no results, I eventually realised that my horse must have died in that attack with the machine gun, which was kind of disappointing because it felt sort of like an off-screen death. Still, I was sad to see my trusty mare Cleopatra gone, especially since it meant I had to spend another few minutes trying to think of a good name for my next one. In most scenarios, your horse is treated like a real creature that needs to be within whistling distance to be summoned. If you're too far away, it won't hear you and won't come running. Sadly, once again, the game suffers from inconsistency and breaks its own rules here, making you question why they bothered putting those rules in place to begin with. If you buy a train ticket as a quick way of getting somewhere distant, your horse will have already beaten you there and will be waiting for you when you arrive by train. I don't think much explanation is needed on why this feels stupid. The game teleports your horse around like this frequently, usually for the sake of convenience at the start and end of missions, and especially when you have to drive a wagon or take some other form of transport that would realistically leave you miles out of whistling range of your mount. Nine times out of ten, the devs get away with it, because in those missions, the game forces you into using other transport, and you usually wouldn't know in advance that your horse will be left behind, but that's not always the case. The very worst example of horse teleportation came late in my playthrough, during a story mission I did with gang member Charles. At the start of the mission, he gives you the option to ride to your destination on horseback, or to travel by canoe, and obviously I chose the one that seemed more interesting. While it did lead to a nice montage, I then had to sit through an incredibly long and conspicuously empty walking section with Charles. I couldn't really believe that Arthur and Charles would spend this entire walk in silence, especially at this crucial point in the story, so I don't understand why there wasn't more dialogue prepared for this potential scene. Anyway, once we made it to the cave that was our destination and finished clearing out the rival gang there, I left the cave only to find that my horse had magically teleported itself to the entrance and was conveniently waiting for me. What irritates me about this example in particular is that the game specifically gave me a choice between bringing my horse or not, and I chose not to, but then my horse just appeared there anyway because the devs needed me to have something to ride for the last part of the mission. And it's this point that I find myself coming back to again and again when thinking about Red Dead Redemption 2. The meticulous simulation that Rockstar created for the game's open world is thrown out the window whenever there's a chance that the player might be inconvenienced in some way. On the one hand, the game has this incredibly detailed world that's so captivating to explore and is capable of surprising and immersing you, but on the other hand, it's like Rockstar doesn't trust you to have the patience to take it seriously, and the game will constantly break its own rules and take away your freedom to smooth out the edges. 
more often than not, the reason this is done is in the name of keeping the player on rails during the game's lengthy story mode, and this leads to a sharp divide between the more open and the more restrictive halves of the game. The thing is though, that the personal stories I experienced while exploring the world for myself were far more enjoyable and memorable to me than the authored story that was supposed to be the main event. The first time I rode into Saint-Denis while roaming around absolutely blew me away. It was just turning to twilight, and after spending hours in the wilderness and the frontier towns of the map's interior, the sight of electric lamps, smog, and the cramped streets of an industrial city offered a contrast I was simply not prepared for, so this awed initial visit left a big impression on me. I can't help but compare that to the game's official introduction to Saint-Denis, which is so underwhelming that I can't believe it looks like this. Presentation is supposed to be the one thing that these story sequences have going for them over the open world, so I have no idea why this boring introduction got the green light. I guess what I'm saying is that the immersive potential of the game's world is the real star of the show in Red Dead 2, not the story. Which is a shame because the story is probably what you'll spend the majority of your time grinding through. Simply put, the long part of the game is not the good part of the game. Here's one last anecdote that showcases how immersive the game's open world can be, which when contrasted with the overly restrictive missions, speaks for itself. It started when I accidentally got into trouble in Saint-Denis. Pursued by armed lawmen, and determined not to kill them for fear of getting a bounty on my head, I tried to flee on foot up the riverbank at the edge of the city, just as a train happened to be passing by, and in my desperate situation I felt I had to take the chance and jump on. One of the lawmen managed to climb aboard too, and I had no choice but to regretfully gun him down. I grabbed the train's controls and turned it up to full speed, and once I'd outrun the lawmen chasing behind me, I jumped from the car and sprinted into the woods, until I came upon a shack. I headed inside to wait out the law's manhunt, only to discover that the shack was occupied, and I ended up in a lengthy scuffle with the inhabitants of this small farm, as each time I thought I was safe, another farmhand appeared and tried to subdue me, until I jumped on the nearest horse and galloped over the hill with bullets flying past my ears. This whole sequence, from the centre of Saint-Denis to that tiny farm in the wilderness, was so much more engaging and dynamic than any of the heavily scripted missions I spent 50 hours slogging through. If a story mission existed where the exact same events transpired, directed by instructions at the bottom of the screen, I wouldn't have been half as interested as I was when I was improvising it all for myself. What really made it special was the emergent and unplanned nature of it. There's just one clear-cut example I can think of in the whole game where this kind of open-world freedom is present in the story, and it comes near the beginning, when you're tasked with stealing an oil wagon from the refinery as preparation for a train robbery that takes place later. You're given no guidance and no limitations on how you choose to accomplish this, and it really is up to you to solve this problem however you want, with whatever tools you have at your disposal. I really wish there was more of this in the game, because it's such a compelling idea, but unfortunately this one bit is all I can recall. If more story missions ask the player to prepare themselves, get something ready beforehand, or bring something to the mission start point, that could be a good way forward for this idea, and I hope to see Rockstar building on the concept in the future. It's time to bring this video to a close, so let me pose you a question that I think gets straight to the contradiction at the heart of Red Dead 2. Is it the purpose of a game to be an obstacle course for the player to dash through, or can they aim to be something more? Your answer to that question will determine how much enjoyment you get out of this game. If you're willing to meet the game halfway and get at least a little bit invested in the simulation it provides, you'll be rewarded with a genuinely unique and fresh experience. If you're not able to do that, you'll likely come away bored to tears by the repetitive gameplay and linear, restrictive missions. It's an unfortunate fact that those story missions, supposedly the main drawer of the game, end up being some of the most underwhelming, bloated and hand-holding parts of the experience. In order to tell the story they wanted to tell, it makes sense that the devs had to sacrifice a certain amount of player freedom during the missions. Until the day that NPCs are controlled by actual AIs and have voice synth dialogue, there's no way any game will be able to have characters react to a player's choices believably and dynamically. Someday that probably will happen, but it won't be in a game like Red Dead Redemption 2, that has a grand, pre-written story it's determined to tell. And for now, Rockstar's solution is to remove choice from the player entirely, keeping them on a scripted path as closely and invisibly as possible. It's a delicate balancing act though, because when that invisible hand shows itself, the entire fantasy can and does come crashing down. Outside of those missions, however, when you and Arthur are free of the demands placed on you by the story, there's so much to discover, so many adventures to be had, 
and so many ways you can use that freedom to really choose how you respond to random events and situations that it's easy to fall deeply into the game's immersive spell. The biggest hurdle in the way of that immersion right now is the repetition of random events as you explore the world, and I'd be willing to trade a smaller map, a shorter story, or almost anything else to get more attention devoted to those open world encounters. Ultimately, while there is fun to be had in the excitement and novelty of Rockstar's set-piece focused mission design, the fondest memories I'll take away from my time with Red Dead Redemption 2 will be of the emergent moments, where it was me writing the script and not somebody else. We can only hope that Rockstar sees the potential here and will develop those emergent systems even further in their future games.